Um, as to the center versus the fringe, I get this all the time. Don't judge religion by its fundamentalists and its extremists. No, why should I? I don't have to. I judge it by its foundational texts, and I judge it by the statements of its authorities. Uh, take a case from the Quran, just for once. Does it, actually it's not the Quran, excuse me. Take a case from the Muslim foundational documents, the Hadith, which have equal canonical authority. They say, if someone becomes an apostate, leaves or changes their religion, they must be killed. The sentence is death. Don't anyone be telling me that's a metaphor? No, oh, it's just intended as a sort of general admonition. No, it means what it says, and it's been applied to a couple of people who now have to live, friends of mine, as a matter of fact, as political refugees in Washington, D.C., who know how true the impact of that hadith. There's no wiggle room there, so the question for a Muslim must be asked. Do you think this is the word of God, or don't you? Because if you don't, you're saying that God shouldn't be able to tell you to do an evil thing, and if you do, you're saying he should. In either case, faith falls as a reinforcement of ordinary morality. Um, recently, uh, Dr. McGrath is a member of uh, the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, the Episcopalian Communion, but what George Herbert, what my favorite religious poet after John Donne, uh, the sweet mediocrity of our native church was how he referred to, uh, uh, the Sea of Canterbury. Everyone thinks it's the mildest of all. It, it not only uh, calls itself a flock, it looks very sheep-like. Um, however, the Bishop of Carlisle recently, the tipped, I'm told, to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, said that the floods in northern Yorkshire that devastated a large part of England in the summer um, and killed and dis dispossessed a large number of people were punishment for homosexuality. Now, to connect meteorology to morality seems to me I have to say, flat out, idiotic, whichever way you do it. If there was a connection between meteorology and morality, which religion has very often argued that there is, I don't see why the floods hit northern Yorkshire. I can think of some parts of London where they would have done a lot more good, <laughs> just as the hurricane that devastated uh, New Orleans, we found punishment for sin as it must have been, left the French Quarter alone. You have to make up your mind on this. You either think God intervenes or he doesn't. I'm clear. I say, I don't think so. Will Dr. McGrath say that he does intervene and that we can tell when he does, or will he not say so? You have to ask him. You have to hear his answer. Does he say sometimes intervenes? Or do you say he moves in mysterious ways? My position is clear. His remains, I think, distinctly opaque. It was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Geoffrey Fisher, who said the following, that a nuclear war, thermonuclear war, would only hasten our transition into a more blessed state into which we were bound to eventuate anyway. If I had told you that remark and asked you to guess, you would have said Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said it, or some other fanatical, verminous mullah. No, the Archbishop of Canterbury said it, and why shouldn't he? Because an another immoral and sinister thing about religion is that lurking un under it at all times, in every one of its versions, is a desire for this life to come to an end, for this poor world to be over. The yearning, the secret death wish that's in all of it, let this be gone, let us move to the next stage, is present at all times unless it's repudiated, which I invite Dr. McGrath to do. But if he does so, I don't see in what eschatological sense he can claim to remain a Christian. And he can't take it a la carte. If you claim or accept the one version, you have to accept the other. If it's true in general that religion does one thing and some people do good from it, then you have to accept all the wicked acts that are attributable to it as well. And I think you'll find that those don't quite equalize at the margin depressing though that conclusion would be. I have a challenge which I have now put in print on the Christianity Today website, in the Holy Blossom Synagogue in Toronto the night before last, in many other places, and on the air and on the web, and it's this. If it's to be argued that our, our morality, our ethics can be derived from the supernatural, um, then name me an action, a moral action taken by a believer, or a moral statement <coughs> uttered by one, that could not have been made or uttered by an infidel, an unbeliever. I have tried this everywhere. On a large number of people, I've not yet had even one reply. But if I was to ask you, can you think of a wicked action that could only have been performed by someone who believed they were on an errand from God, there isn't one of you who would take 10 seconds to think of an example. And what does that tell us? I would, I would say it tells us a lot. And here's the bogus answer to it that was only very gently mentioned by Dr. McGrath this evening. Well, what about atheist nihilism? What about atheist cruelty? What about 20th century 
totalitarianism. I take this seriously enough to have put a chapter in my book about it, available, by the way, at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> and I'll, I can only summarize it now, and I'll do so very as, as tersely as I can. First, <clears throat> fascism, the original 20th century totalitarian movement, is really, historically, another name for the, for the political activity of the Catholic right wing. There is no other name for it. Francoism, Salazarism, what happened in Croatia, in Austria, in Bavaria, and so on. The church keeps on trying to apologize for it, can't apologize for it enough. It's the Catholic right, Mussolini. You can't quite say that about Hitler, National Socialism, because that's also based on Nordic and pagan blood myths, uh, leader worship, and so on, though Hitler never repudiated his membership of the church. Um, and prayers were said for him on his birthday every year till the very end, on the orders of the Vatican. Uh, and all of these facts are well known, and the church still hasn't found another a way to apologize for that enough. And whatever it is you can call that, you can't call it secular. You may not call it secular. By the way, Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. 50%, <clears throat> according to Paul Johnson, the Catholic historian of the Waffen SS, were confessing Catholics. None of them was ever threatened with excommunication, even threatened for it, with it for taking part in the final solution. But Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated for marrying a Protestant. You see, we do have our standards. Now, okay, moving to Marxism, moving to Leninism. Okay, in Russia in 1917, for hundreds of years, millions of people have been told the head of the state is a supernatural power. The Tsar is not just the head of the government, not just a king, but he stands between heaven and earth. Uh, and this, this has been inculcated in generations of Russians for hundreds of years. If you're Joseph Stalin, himself a seminarian from Georgia, you shouldn't be in the totalitarianism business if you can't exploit a ready-made reservoir of credulity and servility that's as big as that. It's just waiting for you to capitalize on. So what do you do? Well, we'll have an inquisition for one thing. We'll have miracles for another. Lysenko's biology will produce four harvests a year. We'll have heresy hunts. We'll tell everyone they must be grateful only to the leader for what they get, and they must thank him and praise him all the time. And that they must be aware all the time of the existence of the counter-revolutionary devil who waits to... You see where I'm going with this? That's not secularism. Um, Michael? Oh, do I need really two? Okay. Um, I'll tell you my North Korea stories another time. Here's the... It's surrogate. It is at the very best and the very worst the examples I've been talking about are a surrogate for messianism, for the belief in ultimate history and the end of days and the conclusion of all things, which is, I've tried to argue, I hope with some success, the problem to begin with, the replacement of reason by faith. The discarding of the one thing that makes us important and useful and different from other primates in favor of something that requires no evidence and just requires incantation. Not good for you. If Dr. McGrath or anyone else could come up with an example of a society which had fallen into slavery and bankruptcy and beggary and terror and misery because it had adopted the teachings and the precepts of Spinoza and Einstein and Pierre Bile and Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, then I'd be impressed. And that would be a fair test on a level playing field. But you will find no such example. Indeed, the nearest such example we do have is these great United States the first country in the world to have a constitution that forbids the mention of religion in the public square, except by way of limiting it and saying that the state can take no interest in establishment of faith. Best known in, under the rubric of the wall of separation, my new slogan is, Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <laughs> Hope you'll join me in it very quickly in my last minute. Yes. Dr. McGrath, you're right. There is something about us as a species that is problematic and isn't just explained by religion. There's something about us that tempts us to do wrong. It's pretty easily explained, I think. We are, we are primates, high primates, but primates. We are half a chromosome away from chimpanzees, and it shows. It especially shows in the number of religions we invent to console ourselves or to give us things to quarrel with other primates about. If anything demonstrates that God is man-made, not man-God-made, surely it is the religions erected by this quasi-chimpanzee species and the harm that they're willing to inflict on that basis. I think on the point of, um, of uh, Christology that you closed with, I ought not to 
take any more of the audience's time, but be prepared to discuss. And I hope I've yielded back some of my time to questions, and I'm grateful again for your indulgence. Thank you. There are many people who call themselves agnostic, and I want to clarify this. It's rather a confusing term. I put up here a scale of religiosity from one to seven, where one is, I know there is a God, and seven is, I know there is no God, and we've got a scale of intermediate agnostic positions in between. Four is exactly 50%. Number four agnostic believes that the probability of God existing and not existing is exactly equal. Number two is, I don't exactly know there's a God, but I have a very high probability. I believe in a very high probability of there being a God. I'm a de facto theist. I can't know for certain, but I strongly believe in God and live my life on the assumption that he's there. Uh, and number six, at the other end, is somebody who believes there's a very low probability of God existing, but still not quite zero. I'm a de facto atheist. I can't know for certain but I think God is very improbable, and I live my life on the assumption that he isn't there. I'm a number six. I'm an agnostic, but with the same level of belief in God as I have belief in fairies or unicorns. <laughs> Bertrand Russell illustrated this with his parable of the celestial teapot. Uh, he pointed out that it is impossible to disprove the hypothesis that there is a China teapot in orbit around Earth, or around the Sun, between the orbits of Earth and Mars. We therefore all have to be agnostic about the teapot theory, but in practice we are all a teapotists. <laughs> I want to make it clear that the agnostic position does not should not be confused with an exact 50-50 probability position. There are people who quite wrongly and illogically say, you can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God, therefore there's an exactly 50% probability of God existing. It's like tossing a penny. That, of course, is completely illogical. Just because you cannot disprove something, and the, and the teapot example shows that, it doesn't mean the odds of it being there are 50%, and you can quickly see that with the example of the teapot. When I debate with Jews and Muslims and Christians, I very often find, I say, well, do you really believe there was a virgin birth? Do you really believe in a Genesis creation? Do you really believe in bodily resurrection? And I get a sort of Monty Python reply. Well, there's a little bit of metaphorical, really. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm going to find out, I'm determined to find out this evening, uh, which line on this my antagonist does take. And I want you to notice, and I want you to test him on it. Because I think it's fair. Um, and I'm going to talk to him and to you as if he did represent the Christian faith. I can't do all three monotheisms tonight. I may get a whack at the other two in the course of the discussion. I can only really do his. And I'm, go I'm going to assume that it means something to him, and that it's not just a humanist metaphysics. And I think I'm entitled to that assumption. Um, the, the main thing I want to dispute this evening, because I'm either drowning in time with 20 minutes, it's either too much or too little, is this. You hear it very often said by people of a vague faith that, well, it may not be the case that religion is metaphysically true. Its figures and its stories may be legendary or, or, or dwell on the edge of myth, prehistoric. Pre um, its truth claims may be laughable. We have better claims, excuse me, better explanations for the origins both of our cosmos and our species now, so much better so, in fact, that had they been available to begin with, religion would never have taken root. No one would now go back to the stage when uh, we didn't have any real philosophy. We only had mythology when we thought we lived on a flat planet, or when we thought that our planet was circulated by the sun instead of the other way around, when we didn't know there were microorganisms as part of creation and that they were more powerful than us and had dominion over us rather than we then, when we were fearful, the infancy of our species, we, we, we wouldn't have taken up theism if we'd known now what we did then. But uh, allow for all that, allow for all that, 
you still have to credit religion with being the source of ethics and morals. Where would we get these from if it weren't for faith? I think if in the time I've got, I think that's the position I most want to undermine. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. I certainly don't believe, of course, that any of its explanations about the origin of our species or the cosmos or its ultimate destiny are true either. In fact, I think most of these have been conclusively, utterly discredited. But I'll deal with the remaining claim. Is it moral, again, I can only do Christianity this evening, is it moral to believe that your sins, yours and mine, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, can be forgiven by the punishment of another person? Is it ethical to believe that? I would submit that the doctrine of vicarious redemption by human sacrifice is utterly immoral. I might, if I wished, if I knew any of you, or you were my friends, or even if I didn't know you, but I just loved the idea of you. Compulsory love is another sickly element of Christianity, by the way. But suppose, I could say, look, you're in debt. I've just made a lot of money out of a God-bashing book. I'll pay your debts for you. Maybe you'll pay me back someday, but for now I can get you out of trouble. I could say, if I really loved someone who'd been sentenced to prison, if I could find a way of saying I'd serve your sentence, I'd try and do it. I could do what Sidney Carton does in The Tale of Two Cities, if you like. I'm very unlikely to do this unless you've been incredibly sweet to me. I'll take your place on the scaffold, but I can't take away your responsibilities. I can't forgive what you did. I can't say you didn't do it. I can't make you washed clean. The name for that in primitive Middle Eastern society was, was scapegoating. You pile the sins of the tribe on a goat, you drive that goat into the desert to die of thirst and hunger, and you think you've taken away the sins of the tribe. A positively immoral doctrine that abolishes the concept of personal responsibility on which all ethics and all morality must depend. It has a further implication. I'm told that I have to have a share in this human sacrifice, even though it took place long before I was born. I had no say in it happening. I wasn't consulted about it. Had I been present, I would have been bound to do my best to stop the public torture and execution of an eccentric preacher. I would do the same even now. No, no, I'm implicated in it. I myself drove in the nails. I was present at Calvary. It confirms the original filthy sin in which I was conceived and born the sin of Adam and Genesis. Again, this may sound a mad belief, but it is the Christian belief. Well, it's uh, here that we find something very sinister about monotheism and about religious practice in general. It is incipiently at least, and I think often explicitly, totalitarian. I have no say in this. I am born under a celestial dictatorship which I could not have had any hand in choosing. I don't put myself under its government. I am told that it can watch me while I sleep. I'm told that it can convict me of, here's the definition of totalitarianism, thought crime. For what I think, I may be convicted and condemned. And that if I commit a right action, it's only to evade this punishment. And if I commit a wrong action, I'm going to be uh, caught up not just with punishment in life for what I've done, which often follows axiomatically, but no. But even after I'm dead, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, gruesome as it is, recommending as it is of genocide, racism, tribalism, slavery, genital mutilation, the displacement and destruction of others, terrible as the Old Testament uh, gods are, they don't promise to punish the dead. There's no talk of torturing you after the earth has closed over the Amalekites. Only till when gentle Jesus, meek and mild, makes his appearance are those who won't accept the message told they must depart into everlasting fire. Is this morality? Is this ethics? I submit, not only is it not, not only does it come with the false promise of vicarious redemption, but it is the origin of the totalitarian principle which has been such a burden and shame to our species uh, for so long. Um, I further think that it undermines us in our most essential integrity. It dissolves our obligation to live and witness in truth. Which of us would say that we would believe something because it might cheer us up, or tell our children that something was true because it might dry their eyes? Which of us indulges in wishful thinking, who really cares about the, the pursuit 
of truth at all costs and at all hazards. Can it not be said, do you not in fact hear it said repeatedly about religion and by the religious themselves that, well, it may not be really true, the stories may be fairy tales, uh, the history may be dubious, but it provides consolation. Can anyone hear themselves say, saying this or have it said of them without some kind of embarrassment, without the concession that thinking here is directly wishful? that yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else and have them dissolved, but it's not true, and it's not morally sound. And that's the second ground of my indictment. Michael, you will tell me when I'm trespassing on the time of uh, Dr. McGrath, won't you? Um, on our integrity, our basic integrity, in knowing right from wrong and being able to choose the right action over a wrong one, I think one must repudiate the claim that one doesn't have this moral discrimination innately, that no, it must come only from the agency of a celestial dictatorship, which one must love and simultaneously fear. What is it like? I've never tried it. I've never been a cleric. What is it like to lie to children for a living and tell them that they have an authority that they must love, compulsory love, what a grotesque idea, and be terrified of at the same time. What's that like, I want to know? And that we don't have an innate sense of right and wrong. The children don't have an innate sense of fairness and decency, which of course they do. What is it like, I can personalize it to this extent. My mother's uh, Jewish ancestors are told that until they got to Sinai, they'd been dragging themselves around the desert under the impression that adultery, murder, theft, and perjury were all fine. They get to Mount Sinai only to be told it's not kosher after all. I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. We must have more self-respect than that for, us, for ourselves and for others. Of course, the stories of fiction. It's a fabrication exposed conclusively by Israeli archaeology. Never, nothing of the sort ever took place. But suppose we take the metaphor. It's an insult. It's an insult to us. It's an insult to our deepest integrity. No, if we'd believed that perjury, murder, and theft were all right, we wouldn't have got as far as the foot of Mount Sinai or anywhere else. Um, now we're told what we have to believe. And this is uh, coming now to the question of whether or not science, reason, and religion are compatible, or I would rather say reconcilable. The great Stephen Jay Gould, the late great Stephen Jay Gould, said that he believed they were non-overlapping magisteria. You can be both a believer and a person of faith. Sitting in front of me is a very distinguished, extremely distinguished scholar, Francis Collins, helped us to unlock the Human Genome Project, who is himself a believer. I, I'd love to hear from him. I hope we will hear from him. I don't believe he says that his discoveries in the genome convinced him of the truth of religion. He, he holds it, as it were, independently. I hope I do you no wrong, sir, in phrasing it like that. Here's why I, a non-scientist, um, a non-scientist uh, will say that I think it's radically irreconcilable, I'd rather say, than incompatible. <clears throat> I've taken the best advice I can on how long Homo sapiens has been on the planet. Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, many others, uh, and many discrepant views in theirs, reckon it's not more than 250,000 years, quarter of a million years. It's not less, either. I think it's roughly accepted. I think, sir, you wouldn't dis disagree. 100,000 is the lowest I've heard. And actually, I was about to say, again, not to sound too Jewish, I'll take 100,000. Um, <laughs> I only need 100,000. Call it 100. For 100,000 years, Homo sapiens was born, usually, well, not usually, but very often, dying in the process or killing its mother in the process. Life expectancy, probably not much more than 20, 25 years. Dying probably of the teeth uh, after that, very agonizingly, near to the brain as they are, um, or of hunger, or of microorganisms that they didn't know existed, or of uh, events such as volcanic or tsunami uh, or earthquake uh, types that would have been wholly terrifying and mysterious, as well as some turf wars over women, land, property, food, other matters. You can fill in, imagine it for yourself, what the first a few tens of thousands of years were like. Um, and we like to think, learning a little bit in the process, and certainly having gods all the way, worshipping bears fairly early on, I can sort of see why, 
Um, sometimes worshiping, worshiping other human beings, big mistake. I'm coming back to that if I have time. Uh, this and that and the other thing. Um, but exponentially perhaps improving, though in some areas of the world very nearly completely dying out and a, a bitter struggle all along. Call it 100,000 years. According to the Christian faith, heaven watches this with folded arms <clears throat> for 98,000 years and then decides it's time to intervene. And the best way of doing that would be a human sacrifice in primitive Palestine, where the news would take so long to spread that it still hasn't penetrated very large parts of the world. And that would be our redemption of the human species. Now, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that that is what I've just said, which you must believe to believe the Christian revelation, is not possible to believe, as well as not decent to believe. Why is it not possible? Because a virgin birth is more likely than that. A resurrection is more likely than that. And because if it was true, it would have two further implications. It would have to mean that the designer of this plan was unbelievably lazy and inept, or unbelievably callous, and cruel, and indifferent, and capricious. And that is the case with every argument for design, and every argument for revelation and intervention that has ever been made. But it's now conclusively so, because of the superior knowledge that we've won for ourselves by an endless struggle to assert our reason, our science, our humanity, our extension of knowledge against the priests, against the rabbis, against the mullahs who've always wanted us to consider ourselves as made from dust or from a clot of blood, according to the Quran, or as the Jews are supposed to pray every morning, at least not female or Gentile. And here's my final point, because I think it's coming to it. <clears throat> the final insult that religion delivers to us, the final poison it jets into our system. It appeals both to our meanness, our self-centeredness, and our solipsism, and to our masochism. In other words, it's sadomasochistic. I'll put it like this. You're a clot of blood. You're a piece of mud. You're lucky to be alive. God fashioned you for his convenience, even though you're born in filth and sin. And even though every religion there's ever been is distinguished principally by the idea that we should be disgusted by our own. Name me a religion that does not play upon that fact. So you're lucky to be here, originally sinful and covered in shame and filth as you are. You're a wretched creature. But take heart. The universe is designed with you in mind. <laughs> and heaven has a plan for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I close by saying, I can't believe there is a thinking person here who does not realize that our species would begin to grow to something like its full height if it left this childishness behind, if it emancipated itself from this sinister, childish nonsense. And I now commit you to the good Dr. McGrath. Thank you. When we go into a garden and we see how beautiful it is and we see colored flowers and we see the butterflies and the bees, of course, it's natural to think there must be a gardener. Any fool is likely to think there must be a gardener. The huge achievement of Darwin was to show that that didn't have to be true. Of course, it's difficult. Of course, it had to wait until the mid-19th century before anybody thought of it. It seems so obvious that if you've got a garden, there must be a gardener who created it and all that goes with that. What Darwin did was to show the staggeringly counterintuitive fact that this not only can be explained by a undirected process, it's not chance, by the way, entirely wrong to say it's chance. It's not chance. Natural selection is the very opposite of chance, and that's the essence of it. That was what Darwin discovered. He showed not only a garden, but everything in the living world, and in principle not just on this earth, but on any other planet, wherever you see the organized complexity that we understand, that, that we call life, that it has an explanation which can derive it from simple beginnings by comprehensible rational means. That is possibly the greatest achievement that any human mind has ever accomplished. Not only did he show that it could be done, 
I believe that we can argue that, any, that, that, that the alternative is so unparsimonious and so counter to the laws of common sense that, reluctant as we might be because it might be unpleasant for us to admit it, although we can't disprove that there's a God, it is very, very unlikely indeed. One point I'd like to make about this is that every human culture has a set of creation myths. Uh, but they're in the realm of uh, mythology or uh, religion or uh, folklore, uh, and they are, of course, all mutually inconsistent. The great thing that is happening in our time is that we are able, through a method which can actually make some progress towards the real universe out there, to find out something about origins, and this is the scientific method applied to the science of cosmology. Very much. And Carl Sagan, in, in your introduction to the book, you commented on this. You said this is also a book about God, or perhaps about the absence of God, because Hawking left nothing for a creator to do. Now, God, of course, means many things to many people. What sort of God basically are we talking about when, when we talk about reading the mind of God? Well, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent question, and, uh, and I'd be most interested to, uh, to hear uh, Stephen Hawking's answer. But just, just to try to illuminate the range of possibilities, consider uh, uh, two alternatives. Uh, one is the, uh, the uh, notion popular in the West uh, of God as a sort of outsized, uh, elderly, white male with a long white beard sitting in a throne in the sky and tallying the fall of every sparrow. Uh, contrast that with uh, the idea of God in the mind of, uh, let's say, Spinoza or Einstein, which was, at least very closely, the sum total of the laws of the universe. Uh, now, it would, would be madness to deny that there are uh, well-defined physical laws in the universe. And if that's what you mean by God, then there's no question that, uh, that God exists, but it's a very uh, remote uh, God, a, uh, what the French call roi fainéant, uh, a do-nothing king. On the other hand, uh, the former model, the, the one who intervenes daily, uh, for that there seems to be, as Dr. Hawking said, uh, no evidence. I think it is wise, my, my own personal feeling, uh, to be a, a little humble. On, uh, on such matters. Uh, we must recognize that we are dealing with, uh, by definition, the most difficult things uh, to know the furthest from human experience. And uh, perhaps we will be able to penetrate a little way uh, into these mysteries. Do you think that the church is, in fact, beginning to recognize that it, it may have to lose its priority, its eminence, as the sole arbiter of, of these matters, and that science will be allowed to come in as an equal partner? Well, the church is certainly, when I say, say the church, the Roman Catholic Church has become very much more liberal. I had the the pleasure of giving a talk in the Vatican myself in the Pontifical Academy of Science quite recently and met the Pope. And of course they're reinstating Galileo and so things are moving. In fact, are they moving backwards as well as forward, Carl Sagan? Because I understand it in the earliest days of civilization, then the priests were in fact what we call the scientists, the ones who could study astronomy and who could predict eclipses and things. Do you see the scientist coming back into an almost sacerdotal position like this, or am I overstating it? Well, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I hope you're overstating it. Uh, I think the essence of uh, the scientific method is the willingness to, uh, to admit you're wrong, the willingness to abandon uh, ideas that don't work, uh, and the essence of uh, religion is not to change uh, anything. The supposed truths are handed down by uh, some revered figure, and then no one is supposed to make any, uh, any progress beyond that because all the truth is thought to be in hand. I'm really talking about setting Please. an agenda for the future. Uh, my sense is that the scientific way of, of thinking, questioning, uh, some delicate mix of uh, creative encouragement of new ideas and the most rigorous and skeptical scrutiny of new and old ideas, uh, I think that is the path 
to the future, not just for science, but uh, for all human institutions. We have to be willing to challenge because we are in desperate need of change. Can I well, you said science should be skeptical of politics. Don't you think we ought to be a little skeptical about science too? I mean, can we trust you guys? I, uh, I think you should certainly be skeptical, but uh, my view is that there is no community of people on the planet more skeptical than science. It's our stock in trade. It's the lifeblood of our subject. Science is a self-correcting subject, not Would you... like politics. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt the presence of the Lord. I have had that personal experience uh, in a way that whatever you say with fancy Darwin talk, I have felt it the way I felt this chair. Yeah. How do you respond uh, to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not impressed by that because there are a similar number of people who are Hindu, brought up Hindus and so I felt the presence of Lord Krishna and etc. I mean, there, there, are, there are all sorts of illusions that the human brain is very capable of, of creating. And, That's um, an illusion. Those uh, people, are yeah. those people deluded, those people that say they have had a religious experience? I think they are, yes. Those people who say that we have experienced a miracle, that God has well, interceded in the world. So. Yes, most definitely. That, that's a delusion. Yes. But the so, notion that raising Lazarus from the dead. Oh, of course. I mean, I mean that, that kind of story happens so easily. It happens to, to this day. There are all sorts of people reporting miracles all the time. And, and we don't, you, you, you don't believe them because it just doesn't happen to chime in with the religion in which you were brought up. Yeah, you, you are absolutely provocative on your descriptions. Uh, read Leviticus, read Deuteronomy. I don't need to, to do any more than just quote. But is that a, a caricature to take the worst uh, or the most fundamentalist, literalist readings of it as opposed to the thousands of years of evolution of all of well, those religions? Two, two things to say about that. One is that there are many people in this world who do take uh, the, the Bible or the Quran, li literally, and literally do think that you should stone homosexuals to death or whatever it might be. On the, and the, uh, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that even those people who don't say that, those people who have, as you say, evolved, have moved on. They have moved on for secular reasons. We've now abolished slavery. We now give equal rights to women. We now give votes to women. That's nothing to do with scripture. That's nothing to do with the Bible. That's come about in spite of the Bible. And people have now gone back to the Bible and said, oh, well, we'll, we'll leave out that bit. We'll leave out that bit. It Although some would say, some some would say the, end, the abolishment of slavery was very much inspired by the Bible, even though slavery might have been the same. Well, you've I got mean, to be joking sure. because, because what, what you're saying is that you can, if you look through the Bible, pick a verse. You can probably find a verse that you can read as abolishing slavery. And then you've got another verse that says you should keep, keep slaves. So you're picking and choosing. That's all I'm saying. We don't get our morals from the Bible because we pick and choose on the basis of a modern morality which has evolved, you're quite right to say it's evolved, it's evolved for secular reasons, and now with hindsight, having evolved our morality for secular reasons, we can go back to the Bible and we can, as it were, rub out the bits that don't fit with our modern secular morality, just don't, don't read them anymore, and that's what people do. The it's word just... God covers an enormous range of different ideas, and you recognize that in the yes. way you phrase the question. <laughs> running from an outsized, light-skinned male with a long white beard sitting in a throne in the sky and tallying the fall of every sparrow, mm -hmm. for which there is no evidence. To my mind, if anybody has some, I sure would like to see it. Um, <clears throat> to uh, the kind of God that Einstein or Spinoza talked about, which is very close to the sum total of the laws of the universe. Now, it would be crazy to deny that there are laws in the universe. And if that's what you want to call God, then of course God exists. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of other nuances. There is, for example, the deist God that many of the founding fathers of this country believed in, although it is a secret whose name may not be spoken in some circles, a, uh, a roi fainéant, a do-nothing king the God who creates the universe and then retires, mm -hmm. and to whom <clears throat> praying to is sort of pointless. He's not here. He went somewhere else. He had other things to do. Now, that's also a God. So when you say, do you believe in God, if I, I say yes or if I say no, you have learned absolutely nothing. I guess I'm asking you to define yours if you have one. But why would we use a word so ambiguous that means so many different things. 
gives you freedom to what, define it. As it you gives choose. you freedom to <clears throat> seem to agree with someone else with whom you do not agree. It covers over differences. It makes for social lubrication. But it is not an aid to truth, in my view. And therefore, I think we need much sharper language when we ask these questions. Sorry to take so long in answering this, but this is an oh, no. important issue. What is your personal religion? Or do you, is there any type of God to you? Like, is there a purpose, given that we're just sitting on this speck in the middle of this sea of stars? Humans have created a mythological framework that has always involved some kind of, often involves some kind of higher spiritual powers. And as every human culture has done that. As that goes away, as we know more and more that, and it seems harder and harder to prove that anything might exist like that, where does that leave us? On our own, which to my mind is much more responsible than hoping mm -hmm. that someone will save us from <laughs> ourselves so we don't have to make our best efforts to do it ourselves. And if we're wrong, and there is someone who steps in and saves us, okay, that's all right. <laughs> I'm for that, but we, you know, hedged our bets. Mm -hmm. It's Pascal's bargain run backwards. I would like to ask you, Professor, what do you have to say to someone, to someone who has met the risen and living Lord Jesus Christ, who has walked with God for over 50 years, <clears throat> who received anointing of the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit with the same consequences as the early apostles in the book of Acts. Sir, what do you have to say? Because I assure you for my life, it has been no delusion. If you had been born in India, I dare say you would be saying the same thing about Lord Krishna and Lord Shiva. If you had been born in Afghanistan, I dare say you would be saying the same thing about Allah. If you had been born in Viking Norway, you would be saying the same thing about Wotan. If you had been born in Olympian Greece, you'd be saying the same thing about uh, Zeus and Apollo. The human mind is extremely susceptible to hallucination. We are incredibly social animals, as I said before, and, and when somebody does you a good turn, it's important to be grateful. You, it's important to pay back the favor and to express your gratitude. And that, I suggest, might generalize the psychological predisp predisposition to feel grateful when something good happens to you. Might generalize from feeling grateful when a person does something good for you and when the weather does, say. Uh, when... Um, a, when, a, when an accident happens, when there's an earthquake and your child doesn't die, you feel grateful. And you feel the need to, to be grateful to something or somebody. And, and you can't feel grateful to other people because they're not responsible for the weather. So you, so you can conjure up a fictitious person to feel uh, grateful to. And that's a special case, really, of the idea that it's good survival practice to suspect agents in nature. A lot of what happens in nature doesn't have an agent deliberately causing it. A lot of it is the weather, a lot of it is the wind, um, a lot of it is just plain accidents that, that happen. But when there are agents around, and where those agents might be lions or leopards or crocodiles who might be lurking in wait for you, or might be stalking you, then it's important for your survival to attribute agency to things. And that may generalize even to places where there's no agency. And I've often used the example of uh, a rustling in the long grass, which could be the wind, is actually most likely to be the wind, but which could be a lion. And although the odds are that it's the wind, uh, your best bet is probably to assume that it's a lion because if you get the bet wrong, um, if, if you bet on it being the wind and your bet is wrong, that, then that, that's, that's rather tragic. Um, <laughs> so um, there may be a psychological predisposition to in, invent agencies, invent agents where there aren't any. And this then, this same psychological predisposition generalizes itself 
to wind gods and thunder gods and and lightning gods and river gods and, and, and sea gods and things like that, which then become merged later on in cultural evolution into the gods, into the named gods like Thor and Zeus and Apollo and Yahweh. Every other proposal and their number is legion to displace us from cosmic center stage has also been resisted in part for similar reasons. We seem to crave privilege merited not by our works, but by our birth, by the mere fact that, say, we're humans and born on Earth. We might call it the anthropocentric, the human-centered conceit. This conceit is brought close to culmination in the notion that we are created in God's image. The creator and ruler of the entire universe looks just like me. My, what a coincidence. How convenient and satisfying. The 6th century BC Greek philosopher Xenophanes understood the arrogance of this perspective. Here's what he said. The Ethiopians make their gods black and snub-nosed. The Thracians say theirs have blue eyes and red hair. Yes, and if oxen and horses or lions had hands and could paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, Horses would paint the forms of the gods like horses, and oxen like oxen. Guys, don't you find it weird that non-religious individuals like those we've seen in today's hour long video are the ones non-spokenly tasked with the role of proving that God as described in religious texts doesn't actually exist, man. Especially when they're not the ones claiming that a bearded wise man living in the skies is responsible for creating everything in the universe as we see it today. When and how do you get to the point to a man that those that make these claims aren't responsible for proving even an ounce of their God's great power? I mean, think about it, guys. If their creator is responsible for all these feats, like creating the universe and every single thing in it, can't they simply ask him to do something even as menial as letting a tree on fire in front of the whole world immediately after a preacher or whatever religious leader calls upon him to do so? I don't know about you guys, but that will be a little more than sufficient to make me doubt whatever anti-organized religion stances I hold within myself at this point. And that's actually an understatement, man. I think I'd become the most devoted member of whatever religious organization is responsible for calling upon that specific power. Anyway, yeah. But instead, man, we live in a world where injustices thrive countries like America, single-handedly destroy entire nations around the world in the name of God. And we actually even had a church in my country burn with its worshippers inside because some nut jobs from the same Christian community were unhappy with the election results in 2007. We have, man, complete innocent children and infants going out in some of the most excruciating ways every day around the world for for multiple reasons and these religious leaders are convinced that God for some reason couldn't eliminate even a single one of those clear and fair misfortunes in the world today. And actually hear me out guys, and these religious individuals tend to claim that, you know, all this is happening because of the evil invited by humans on earth by our sinful ways, that all this suffering wouldn't be a thing if we were not sinners, simply put. And while that argument makes no sense to me and shouldn't to anyone with true working brain cells, the point is, if that's actually the case, then we should shouldn't call him an all-good, all-loving, and all-caring God. I don't know about you guys, but if I love and care for a person, and I'm also a good person, that means I'd still do my best to get them out of any misfortunes way, despite their shortcomings or poor decisions in the past. For example, simply because my ex cheated on me doesn't mean I'll learn about some guys planning to do the unimaginable to her and not actually step in to make sure that doesn't really happen. And to conclude, you know what kind of person I'd be if I let it happen and just said, well, if she hadn't cheated on me and broken my heart, then I would have stepped in and stopped this unimaginable act. That would obviously make me a
or am I wrong? Anyway, as I was saying, if it is indeed true that all this injustice to innocents and children is happening because we are sinners, simply put, then why do religious people thank God and exalt him when they, say for example, someone survives an accident, heals from a sickness, or doesn't board a plane that was going to crash? Shouldn't that be left to chance as well, just as our misfortunes? Because otherwise, why would God find these people and fully grown adults worth saving but as as we've said, not the myriad of young ones that go out in disturbing ways around the world. Why, man? Remember, if he indeed has intervened in saving these guys, that implies it must be well within his ability to eliminate earthquakes, for example, floodings, wildfires, and tornadoes with the snap of a finger. But he doesn't. Or do these guys still believe that this phenomenon in the world are caused by us on scenes as well? Man, disappointing stuff, man. No answer they can give will make any sense to you. It's never made any sense to me, and I've actually come across pastors that have vast the same exact questions. I mean, I actually have an idea. If religious people don't mind worshipping a being that, according to religious texts, allowed people to be sold into slavery, instructed kings to slaughter, everyone during wars, including children and innocent people. And you guys also remember what happened to the Canaanite saw God's favorite children could have a home. If they're willing to worship that, wouldn't they be even safer worshipping scientists, man? I mean, most of them are definitely but crazy and have done questionable things in the name of science. But that's not different to some of the things the higher being in religious texts has done to show his glory throughout the Bible, the Quran, or whatever. At least with scientists, the results are evident and we've all witnessed them in our lives and they've improved their human experience. I mean, scientists guys have created a weapon so powerful we've been unable to come up with a countermeasure for almost a century now. Nuclear weapons. They've also found solutions to diseases that we didn't even know existed a few decades ago. So to conclude, man, they've done some pretty crazy things that we just discount because we're used to it now. The telephone, for example, where I can communicate with you guys across the world in an instance. Man, poof, it's actually crazy, man. But again, we're used to these things, so we just assume they're normal. Yeah, anyway, the bottom line is that we know religious people will never go for that. Definitely. If anything, they'll use the achievements by these scientists to remind their congregations of God's <laughs> glory. Ah, man. This shit is sad. I actually remember my friend and I laughing not long ago because a distant family member that was down on his luck had come to this friend and explained how he actually hadn't had anything to eat for almost two days and his house was going to get locked by the landlord if he did not find a way to raise the $50 rent he owed. Yeah, that's the approximate rent in my country. So yeah, my friend, being the next guy, he was, handed the cousin the amount he needed, but the cousin immediately looked up to the skies, his hands stretched, and thanked the Lord, man. The only thing he said directly to acknowledge my friend helping him was, man, I wish you knew just how much I've prayed to the Lord for a solution to my problems, man. And here you are, his servant sent to deliver my salvation. <laughs> It was definitely poetic, but my friend couldn't help but laugh in his mind by the absurdity of it all, man. Yeah, anyway, that's it, guys. I know for a fact that none of the arguments made in the long video will change the minds of most people that are staunch believers. I'm not even sure, actually, that they'll find their way to this video. But yeah... I'm glad I got the chance to put the videos together and I really hope you've enjoyed listening to these quite smart individuals as much as I did putting the videos together for this compilation. And if you have a video you're sure I and other skeptics out there will enjoy, kindly let me know in the comment section below and I'll find it and include it in the next ones. And for those who have subscribed to the channel and left a like on the video or even left a comment so the video can reach even more people, I cannot begin to express my gratitude man in the meantime stay safe guys and i'll see you all in the next one peace